I'll try this again. I'd like to call to order the Committee of the Whole for the Beverly um, Public Schools School Committee. Today is Wednesday, February 26th. It is 7.32 p.m. Our first order of business will be to approve the meeting Pledge records. Oh, Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mayor. Why don't you lead us? Sure. <laughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for that. Our next order of business will be the approval of the meeting records from our last meeting. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Do we have any corrections, edits? All those in favor? Okay, we are 6-0, and Mr. Milady sends his regrets. He's not able to join us this evening. Um, next item on our agenda is getting right to Dr. Trocek's presentation about the Student Opportunity Act and our plan that we must present. All right, good evening. I, um, I uh, was asked to come forward with some information to share with all of you about the Student Opportunity Act and the impact that it might have on any of the budget planning that we have in place, as well as the requirements for the plan that we have to present to the Department of Ed. So I put together sort of a few slides to kind of guide the discussion. Please feel free at any time throughout it to ask questions um, as we go. Um, the first, this first, this is actually a repeat slide for most of you. Uh, I've re showed it a couple times, but really is just sort of a summary of what the Student Opportunity Act is. Um, a lot, we've had a lot of conversations and a lot of discussions. Uh, there have been a lot of stakeholders across Massachusetts who have contributed to uh, the uh, effort to have the Student Opportunity Act passed. Um, it's a $1.5 billion uh, new investment in Massachusetts public education. Um, it's estimated that over time it could provide $2.2 billion. Um, it's, it, it's phased in over a number of years. Um, it's a law, so that's important to remember. It's, it is a law, and it, it implements the recommendations of the 2015 Foundation Budget Review Commission. So for those people who are, uh, are less familiar, the Chapter 70 funding had, uh, for years was a, a based upon a certain formula. In 2015, there was a review commission that came together to re- um, authorize that formula as to how Chapter 70 money was shared to districts um, in Massachusetts. Um, it particularly significantly targets districts that serve high percentages of low-income students through updates to the funding formula. It increases the investment in programs such as transportation, in school buildings, and in special education. And finally, it is designed with some monitoring and measuring uh, requirements um, to measure progress and support approaches that close opportunity gaps. So there is some very specific targeting as to how they're hoping that districts utilize this money um, that they receive. Just a quick review, what is Chapter 70 funding? Chapter 70 program is the major program of state aid to public and elementary, public elementary and secondary education. Um, if you were here at the finance and facilities meeting, it's a part of how we get funded. Um, there's uh, it, it combined with city contribution, with uh, grants, with other allocations is how we fund public education in Beverly. Um, and its purpose is to ensure that we have the sufficient resources that we need to meet foundation budget spending level. Um, and it's through an equitable combination of local property taxes and state aid. So we're here because, or, or we're having this conversation because our Chapter 70 funding aid in Beverly has increased, and I sort of thought I'd start with why is that? Why are we getting more Chapter 70 money in Beverly? Um, first, um, it really does reflect an increase in total enrollment in our schools as we go through the presentation. Um, I'll show you, I think you might find it as surprising as I did as I put the numbers together, what our increases in enrollment are. Um, it increases funding for our in-district special education enrollment, so the formula actually changed and increases the funding for in-district special education. The rate of out-of-district special education tuitions is increasing, and so it reflects that. Um, it reflects incremental rates that were restructured for English language learners, in particularly focusing on an increment for high school students, um, given the challenge of learning a new language at an older age. And then finally, starting in FY20, there is a targeted high needs concentration increment for districts that serve the highest concentration of both economically disadvantaged and EL students in the Commonwealth. So one of the things you'll hear about the Student Opportunity Act is that um, 
the largest amount of money went to the sm a small number of districts. There are some districts that received more than 1.5 million in funding, um, and those districts, uh, you know, were those that were identified that were serving the highest concentrations. So, what is that increase that we got? Our Chapter 70 funds that we received in FY20 were 9,257,567. And our preliminary estimates, these are preliminary, nothing's approved yet, just be sure, uh, but it's, it's good news. Uh, it looks as if we will be receiving 10,262,735 in FY21. Um, that's an incremental increase of 1,005,168. And I, that, I'm learning as I go along that that language incremental increase is a really, is kind of the, the language that is being adopted by the Department of Ed and by other people. So um, in, in thinking about that, what was our incremental increase, which just means how much more did we get this year than we got last year. So um, with the Act, there were some commitments that districts were requ are required to make in order to receive the additional funding. Um, and so there are basically four commitments. Um, the, it requires districts to create a three-year evidence-based plan um, that include, first, an intentional focus on student subgroups that are not achieving at the same level as their peers, to adopt, deepen, or continue specific evidence-based programs to close the opportunity and achievement gaps, and to allocate resources to these programs, to monitor success in reducing the disparities in achievements among subgroups, and finally, to engage families, and particularly those families that represent the student subgroups that, that are targeted. So, I mean, this is just the kind of the principles of which we have to keep in mind as we go ahead and create our plan. Um, you may have heard that Beverly is a short-form district, so what does that mean? Um, in, in Massachusetts, if you are a district that received less than $1.5 in incremental Chapter 70 funding, you'll fill out a short-form template um, I have an example of that on my next slide. Um, it's important to remember that um, while our budget won't be approved until sometime in June, we are required to submit this plan by April 1st. Um, and so I think that um, it poses some challenges, but also actually I think some opportunities for us to just get, move through the budget process at a little earlier pace than we may have in previous years. Um, the districts must provide certification that they engage stakeholders in accordance with the Student Opportunity Act, and I'll be explaining that a little further. And finally, the plan must be voted on for approval by the school committee, and we have to certify to the department that a vote has taken place by the school committee on the plan that we're submitting. So, so this is with a temp, it's really short, nice two-page uh, template. Um, they really put an, uh, the department put an emphasis on trying to eliminate needless paperwork and, and, and have districts spend time engaging with stakeholders and engaging in conversation about what they would do with the money rather than long requirements and complicated uh, ways of documenting how they did that. So this is what the template looks like. Um, we haven't started filling it in yet, but that's what the blank template form looks like. So the department provided guidance to districts. Um, again, this is new for everyone across the Commonwealth, and so um, they have provided us some, some guidance into how to create a uh, successful uh, Student Opportunity Act plan. And remember, you vote on it, I submit it, it has to be approved. So according to them, if we do the things that are listed here, then we will create a plan that will be approvable, and so um, hopefully we'll have no trouble with that. Uh, first of all, we need to uh, focus on disparities in performance among our student subgroups. Um, we need to utilize evidence-based programs to address um, uh, the different things, that, the different requirements. So DESE provides us with a specific program, uh, a menu of specific programs that would satisfy the statutory requirement. They've sort of interpreted that statutory requirement and given a, a menu list of about 17 or 18 different um, programs that they consider to be evidence-based programs. Um, we are required in our plan to be explicit as to how the program that we're choosing and how the allocation of the funds that we allocate link to the student subgroups. We need to identify which school, schools, or a district-wide program who, who will, that this will impact. And then finally, we have to identify funding sources. So for example, if we're going to expand a program that already exists and we currently utilize some um, Title I money, we can identify that we're using some money from Title I and some money from the um, incremental increase that we got in order to accomplish the goals that we set. Um, 
we are required to monitor with outcome metrics and targets. So we have to identify which district, district determined measure or DESE determined outcome measures that we're going to use to measure our progress in our, in our plan. We have to align those to the statewide targets that are set by the Department of Ed. So in our accountability measures, we are, we are given explicit targets. So students in grade four economically disadvantaged should be hitting this target on the MCAS. Students in grade seven who are Hispanic Latino should be hitting a particular um, target on the, on the that, those are the targets, that's what they mean when they talk about them. Um, and then finally, um, anything we say in this plan doesn't supersede or, or negate any of the accountability measures that the Department of Ed are going to put on us regardless. So um, we, we can't like change the target or lower it or, or it doesn't matter. It won't, it won't change the outcomes on our accountability. And then finally, we really, it's, it's required that we engage the community, that we include specific plans targeted to parents and guardians of low income, English language learners, and students with disabilities. So this, you know, if we do just simply this, we'll be approved and we'll do it. But it's, it's actually quite complex and a lot, um, a lot of moving parts, so. Um, this is an example. I told you there were 17. We just grabbed six that we felt aligned somewhat to the district goals that we currently have. Um, the, the first one that is listed here, research-based early literacy programs in pre-K and early elementary, um, that's actually a priority program. So the Department of Ed has identified two or three priority programs, which if in fact they're included in your Student Opportunity Act plan, makes you eligible for future possible funding that may come along to enhance that program. Um, we actually in Beverly, as part of our goals, are taking a close look at our early grades in literacy and, um, you know, just revamping them. We're looking at, uh, uh, we're auditing the curriculum that we have right now and looking at the programs that we're using and determining are we going to stay with that. Our licenses are expiring, so it's, it, it actually aligns beautifully with something that we might already need to do. Um, you can support educators to implement high quality aligned curriculum. Um, that's clearly, you know, areas of professional development and or providing uh, positions of support that to support curriculum development. Um, expanded access to career technical education, including after dark. That is exactly what we brought forward before we even knew it was on their list around the work with Essex Tech. Um, increased personnel and services to support holistic student needs. I'm interpreting that um, sort of some of the conversations we've had around social emotional learning and making sure that we're um, working with the whole child. Uh, project based learning and skill academies to support targeted development and accelerate advanced learners. So, we, uh, this uh, is opportunities for extended school years. So whether during school vacation years you're doing some acceleration academies or something in the summer that's providing skill academies for students. Um, increased staffing to expand student access to the arts, athletics, enrichment, and strategic scheduling to enable common planning time for teachers. And um, in particular at the high school, that's one of the specific goals that Mrs. Taylor's thinking about working on and looking at that schedule as to how she can increase opportunities for common planning. So these are just examples of what the department is calling evidence-based programming. Um, and so um, I wanted to share that with you. And finally, we uh, planning for stakeholder engagement. So we, um, you know, in terms of reaching out to the community, taking a look, we uh, have two meetings planned already with parent groups. There's a presentation and forum at the Beverly CPAC meeting at, on March 10th, which will be held at the McEwen building. And there's a presentation and forum at the Beverly LPAC meeting on March 10th, which will be held at North Beverly. CPAC is our Special Education Parent Advisory Committee, and LPAC is our English Language Learners Parent Advisory Committee. Um, we have a teacher forum scheduled on uh, Tuesday, March 3rd, here at the middle school following our PD day. So we're going to engage our teachers and our union um, in discussions and conversations around uh, their ideas of the needs uh, that we have. And then finally, we've been really thinking about the parent forum. We're tossing around a couple of different ideas, particularly to target some low income. We had a suggestion of maybe partnering with bootstraps and finding a way to um, pr have a parent forum wh where we're partnering with some of the community uh, people that do that. But that's just an idea, light bulb right now. We haven't finalized any of that. Here's the challenge. The plan's due April 1st. We need to get the feedback before we write the plan. So it's a very short window of setting up some of these um, parent forums. But um, we're, that's the last one that we 
to do to determine the date. But um, we believe if we do that, we'll at least we'll have met the um, requirements. But I think more importantly, we'll be opening ourselves up to have some real dialogue with parents and families and engaging families that may not have been engaged in some of the conversations that we've had. So I think it really brings a great opportunity to us to kind of uh, be able to do some more outreach and have some more involvement from our parents. So that is the Student Opportunity Act and the plan and the requirements that we have as we move forward. I'm happy to answer any questions along if anyone has any so far. Oh, I, I have a few. So I'll do one and then we'll see if anybody else wants to cut in. Um, Dr. Trilchuk, I was wondering if you could speak to your, uh, your position mm -hmm. on um, the the wording in the Student Opportunity Act around opportunity gaps versus achievement gaps. Hmm. Well, that's deep. It is deep. <laughs> we, we can take that offline. I'll, I'll take that one right offline if you wish. Well, we, no, we I'm, I, well, I'm, I'm happy. I would, I would be happy to just say, and you and I have had this conversation before. So I believe that when people consider the achievement gap, the first thing that comes to mind is let's take a look at MCAS and how did students in a particular subgroup perform on this MCAS test and how does that compare to students that, so if you're economically disadvantaged, we have a group of students that are performing more poorly than our aggregate or from our non-economically disadvantaged students, right? And if there's a gap, people say, well, that's an achievement gap. Um, I hate to hang my hat on one test one time a year, and I'm, I'm not sure that there's not some bias built into the MCAS. That's probably more of a personal opinion than anything else, but, but I think that in, in general, when people think about an achievement gap, that's what they think of. So, um, and in their mind, they say, well, our students don't do as well academically at school if they are in a, a, a protected subgroup or in a student subgroup that we have, that we, we traditionally think is underperforming. When I think about the opportunity gap, that, that I brought, that broadens it for me. I think about areas like advanced coursework at the high school. So how often are our kids exposed to the opportunity to be in advanced coursework or take dual enrollment classes or um, some of those things? I think about the opportunity to participate in some of our, um, and maybe not even extracurricular, but, but including extracurricular activities. Are we opening up and, and allowing them? Are we equally represented in our um, DECA club? And are we equally represented in our um, United, United Nations, what is that called? Model UN. Model UN. Right, you know, so for me, I think that it's, it's two things that we look at. One is how are we doing in addressing skill deficits that students might have academically in the classroom, and how are we doing in making sure that our experience and our out, student outcomes at graduation are equal and equitable for students regardless of how they start, where they come from, and how do we make sure that um, everybody has a fair and equitable opportunity to thrive in the Beverly schools. Is that deep? I don't know. That's great. That's great. <laughs> I, I asked that question because I'd, I'm not sure that, um, you know, the average listener, and we know we have just a ton of people watching from yes. home, um, <laughs> or that that necessarily anybody, when you, when we go have our meetings out in the community, that, that people understand those differences, and, and they are distinct and separate. Yeah. You're absolutely right, right? One is, one is, what are we looking at on paper? And the other one is, um, truly, what opportunities are provided to you? Um, and, and you gave some really good examples. Um, Madam Chair, may I go on? Go ahead. Um, do you have any um, do you have any tangible examples of um, an evidence-based program versus a non-evidence-based program? And maybe an easier way of answering that is to say, are we are we knowingly running programs today in our school district that are quote unquote non-evidence-based or, or are considered non-evidence-based as opposed to, for instance, the early literacy program that, that you're already looking at? So I think the, and again, I, can, I can't really speak for the commissioner or for all of the people at the Department of Ed who put the guidance together on their interpretation of the act, but I believe that their uh, choice of utilizing the language evidence-based program was to separate it from other operating costs in the district. So in other words, they were trying to say that an incremental increase that's specifically targeted as the Student Opportunity Act on your plan is going to address these student groups and certainly you'd use an evidence-based program that's going to move them forward. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I know that the Department of Ed had some concerns around um, um, uh, 
across the Commonwealth, not just in Beverly, so this wasn't about Beverly specific, but that, that you know, there might be um, uh, districts that are in negotiations and, and having all the money eaten up by just raises for programs that are going on right now, you know, allocating um, specific uses of money that don't directly impact these student groups. Um, I don't, I hope that we don't use any educational programs that aren't evidence-based in our schools, right? I think, but I do, but you have to look at what we use the money in the $61 million budget that we have. There are operating costs, so utilities probably wouldn't be something. Um, although I, I believe that for districts that are over 1.5 million, they have been allowed to use it for some repairs for buildings. So Lynn, for example, got $30 million. So they're, the way they can use the money is different than, and they're a long form, remember the short form, versus is long right. form, so. Is there anyone beside that? Okay. One more. Go Thank you. Ms. Wisnick. Uh, um, so my last, my last question is around um, the, um, the outreach to the families, mm -hmm. and I believe that you have um, done some on-site work, we'll call it, um, some visitation up into, for instance, Apple Village, and so um, I wonder if that, um, and I, I realize April 1st is very, very quickly coming upon us, but if that isn't another way for a very specific subgroup, mm -hmm. for a portion of our um, yeah. economically disadvantaged to be, um, right, to, to meet our clients where they are, so to speak, right. right, to go on site, which in that particular setting is very convenient as opposed to any given other neighborhood, maybe our, um, those students are, scattered about yeah we have um, we've actually had a lot of conversation about uh, location and how we do that and how we make it you know um, uh, accessible for all groups um, the the window is really small so you know we have a two three week window perhaps but that is one of the thoughts and ideas and I actually had mentioned how I had uh, gone out to uh, Apple Village and also uh, to some of the meetings with some of the Gloucester Crossing um, groups too so, so. I guess I, my, might it be do you have in your head one like oh we're going to do something at Beverly High like we did um, the Title One Math Nights mm -hmm. that everybody quote unquote has to come to us or do you have in your mind that it might be some go out into the neighborhoods? I have both in my mind and Fantastic. we haven't, we haven't okay, made great. a decision yet on that. Well, I did we did have a leadership meeting yesterday and I did reach out to principals and said uh, you know we're going to need some help. So um, I, personally, I can't. I don't know that I can be in all of the places at one time. However, that doesn't mean that a principal couldn't be at one location or, you know, Dot, we're already on March 10th, Dot's going to be in one and I'm going to be in the other. And so, but we are, it, it, we're thinking about that because I honestly do believe this is a really good opportunity for us to go out and be able to make some connections that we might not have made if we didn't have this opportunity, so. And regardless of the work we need to do for this meal here when we do our entry plan, that that's something yeah. that we've talked about, about being able to get out to where people are versus keeping yep. bringing them to us. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's the there's the unavoidable rush of needing to respond by April first, with this being the first go round. I'm gonna guess that that same type of outreach would be expected next year. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you may look and say, well, you know, we've got We've got opportunities in an unhurried fashion at different times of the year mm -hmm. to do more of that work, and that may lead into a you know a more robust opportunity going in a year from now. Yeah, I think I, I mean 100%. I, I, I think this is. Um, if we are going to impact the student subgroups that are targeted, we need to do a better job of that. And so it, it offers us an opportunity to rethink and um, you know re envision how we do that and what we do. And um, you know I've tried on a couple of occasions to do some reach out, and I think this will help us or require us or both to be more purposeful and more uh, strategic and um, make sure we stick to it. And so I think that it's a really good opportunity. <coughs> Do we have any questions on the Student Opportunity Act? Okay. Well, thank you very much for all of this information. It was very helpful. So our next agenda item this evening is to have um, a continued look at our FY21 budget and have some further discussion about our connection to our priorities that we've identified. Awesome. All right. So I, again, have put together, sort of just synthesized some information together for you, and I'll walk you through. Please stop me as I go along if you have questions. Um, 
I wanted to start, first of all, by outlining the budget process. For some of you, it's your first time through the budget process with school committee. So um, I just sort of wanted to be, uh, provide some clarity as to what we do um, in our work as we prepare to come forward with a preliminary budget to you. Um, so the first, first and foremost, when we start the budget process, and this was back in December, November, December, it begins with some collaboration with our principals in the central office to sort of develop a shared vision um, and a shared framework that would guide our decisions as we go forward. Um, that out of that came our uh, activities that we ran both with school committee and with other stakeholders to identify priorities. What are you? What are you all feeling? Our priorities for us to address and things that we should be looking for um, within the budget uh, to provide opportunities. Um, this year, we had the added uh, responsibility of identifying the impact of the Student Opportunity Act and understanding the requirements of the additional Chapter 70 funding. Um, However, uh, one of the things that we took from it, and I don't know if it's because we're doing the entry plan at the same time we're doing you know, a lot of other things, but we felt this was a great opportunity for us to identify some administrative efficiencies and restructuring opportunities that the additional funding may bring. I think that's actually spilled out into other areas. If you were at FNF uh, at the Finance and Facilities meeting, um, Jean outlined some work she had done in her department around identifying efficiencies and looking for restructuring opportunities. So we're trying to do that across the board as we go go through using this as an opportunity. Um, assessing enrollments and the impact that would have on staffing and um, I think the enrollment information um, even caught me off guard a little bit which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, it brought some, we all spent some time reflecting on, on what that was and, and what it meant. Um, we review requests from funding from various departments. So if you've looked ahead at the presentation, you might have been um, a little shocked by the number of requests, but that's actually how it goes every year. <coughs> Everybody comes forward with their requests, and we do want to know what it is. We like to try to think three to five years, so we have these requests coming in. What are things that we could do this year? What are things we might do next year? Um, those were just a, a, an example of the requests that came forward. Um, and then finally, we collaborate with uh, both the mayor and Bryant um, and um, work together to determine what that proposed city contribution is in relationship with the school budget. So um, th that's the process that we have that we go through. Um, and um, all the while, <coughs> through the entire process, at least for me and for the leadership, and with, I've been help, hoping to guide all of you that we remain focused on what our district goal areas are, right? So our budget should reflect our goals. Our goals should be reflected in our budget. And so um, really trying to make sure that we're, we're staying true to uh, a, a roadmap so that we're not all over the place. Um, so we feel that the strategy for district improvement um, has a roadmap been a roadmap that we've been following? Um, we're, it's fluid. We're going to continue to refine it as we go through. Um, it's impacted by the input that we get from all of you around what your priorities are. It's impacted by input that we get from the teacher groups and from um, the parent groups, too, to make sure that we're all kind of working together. So these are the priorities that, that rose to the top in our exercises that we did. We did a lot of, um, we, we were moving back and forth. We had it started off with our sheets where everybody did a little post-it note and then we synthesized them down and then there were check marks and um, we did that with all of the groups and really these are the areas that rose to the top. So um, the top, one, a couple of the top priorities, reducing and or eliminating kindergarten fee and I like to to put the check mark right next to that one and a financial analyst put another check mark next to that one at our finance and facilities meeting uh, earlier tonight. We. Uh, are bringing forward to the committee um, a position for that. So um, that that the other priority areas, though, that we still want to address, um, counseling supports and trauma-sensitive classrooms, and that's not to say that we haven't done anything. I, I want to point out, um, you know, through last year's budget process and into this year's, we have been adding counseling supports. We've added some outreach counselors. Um, we've been addressing them all as we go uh, as we go along. Um, that doesn't mean that we aren't going to continue to look for ways to kind of improve and strengthen those things in our schools. Career pathways um, was another area that rose to the top, and that's something that we continue to address. Um, the Essex Tech is just one pathway. We're really looking to make sure that we have multiple pathways to offer to our students as they go through the schools. Um, and then finally, academic excellence in a lined, rigorous curriculum. And so um, that 
I think the combination of our work with priorities, our entry plan, our interviews that we've had with people, and we'll be speaking a lot more to that as we go forward, um, but that continues, and that was a very strong priority from the leadership team as well. So um, so these are, these are kind of the things that we're keeping in mind as we build the budget and as we work together to do that. It's important to think about what factors impact this FY21 budget. Um, We've said it a couple times, you'll hear me say it probably four million be, not again, but we have contractual obligations that those are not fluid, those are not flexible, those are real actual numbers and we are obliged contractually to meet those funding, that funding. Um, enrollment, which we'll be talking a little bit more about tonight. The Student Opportunity Act and the restrictions that come with it, which now I've had an opportunity to kind of share with you and I hope you have a, a little better um, understanding of that. And then finally, the department funding requests. What can we and what can't we accomplish in this year and how do we make a plan to uh, make sure because what we know that without um, good facilities and strong, uh, strong um, operating areas in the district, you know, we're going to run into trouble, so. So here are our contractual obligations. Um, the cost of living is, uh, right now we're in negotiations for the 21 to 23 contract, so that's to be determined. I just sort of thought that for you it would be nice to keep in mind what a percentage increase of our salaries would be. So if we, if, if we were negotiating, 1% uh, increase of all the salaries would be 446173 and a 2% increase would be 892346 So just nice to know what we're talking about when we start to talk about percentages and, and all of that. Um, our steps, we are obligated to $511,714. Um, that means uh, in for, if, if you're not familiar with that, steps are uh, the number of years you teach. Every year you teach, you move down a step until you get to a certain point. And so there are percentage increases that are built into those steps as you go down. And so teachers work through their grid uh, based upon the number of years of service that they have. There are lanes, lanes are columns, I call them columns, Jean calls them lanes. Columns are uh, based upon the education that you have, so as you acquire uh, more graduate work and more graduate credits and graduate degrees, you move across that same grid and uh, we anticipate that um, teachers, we don't know that exact number because we have to get they have to submit grade reports and all of that, but we anticipate that number based upon the requests for column moves to be around $180,000. And then finally, health care increase, that's uh, a number that Brian had brought forward with us at 3% is 232737 So those are our contractual obligations. There's not wiggle room in those. They're, they're there. And now we get to enrollments. And so I have to tell you, this was a surprise for me. I mean, I've been watching and I've been, it was really funny. Someone would say to me, how many kids are in the Beverly schools? Ah, oh, about 4,500. That was a couple of years ago. And I was like, well, I think it might be about 4,600. And when I finished and realized that we're over 4,700, that was a big surprise to me, even to me. So, um, it's the, exciting though. It's super exciting. And I think it's even more exciting when you watch what I'm going to present because what we're finding is that we're bringing families into Beverly in our elementary schools and they're staying. And so the reason that it's, we don't have 40 kids showing up to register. It's not that. It's that our numbers are higher and they're, as we, we're aging out smaller graduating classes, so we're graduating out 270 kids and we're enrolling 410, right? Like, you know, it, it, that's where the differences are coming. So um, there are very big increases. We had a really big spike in kindergarten in FY20. Um, I think you'll notice, we, I've been asked the question by a couple of you, are my concerned that we're going to go up to 400 again? I don't believe so. We're currently at, four, at 328, which is lower than we were last year at this time. And we also, we have spikes sometimes. So I think sitting in our rising seventh grade, there's 398 kids. So occasionally we have a cohort of students that, that have a bubble. Um, and I don't know the exact reason for that. Um, we believe we're on track to be right in there around 360 or 370. So that there's an asterisk there because we don't know until September 1 what the actual number will be. Yep. Uh, so, <clears throat> oh, sorry, Ms. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, 
so I, every other number on the sheet is um, diagonal over and down mm -hmm. one, except for this year's kindergarten class at 410. You're projecting that next year to be in first grade at 425. That is because we've had actually 15 kids register for first grade that were sitting in private kindergarten somewhere this year. Thank you. <laughs> not, not really thank you, but th thank you for that explanation. But. And that's to date, but that, yes, there were 15 new. So if the number goes up in FY21, it's only because we've counted an actual new registration. Um, otherwise, we did just roll from one to another. So, yeah. So we're glad they went to private kindergarten last year because we would have run out of space. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> we will make room for you. Please come. Um, so so in, in elementary, we had 1,798 students in FY19, and we have 1,884 students in FY, projected in FY21. Our middle school enrollments, I think, stick more closely to that pattern that you just uh, described. Um, but there's that bubble in FY19, that 398 was in fifth grade. It was 394 in 20, and we anticipate three now. These numbers will go up and down over the summer. We'll have some students that leave. We'll have some students that register. But for the most part, they remain pretty, pretty steady. So we had 1,421 in FY19 when we opened the new middle school. We anticipate 1,482 in FY21. And then finally, here was the biggest surprise for me. It was the high school. So, and, and it was that realization that the graduating classes that are leaving are much smaller than our kindergarten classes that are enrolling. And so um, in FY19, we had 1,249 students. We anticipate 1,339 at the high school. Um, Betty was happy to hear me say that I understand why she's asking for more teachers because I kept saying, Betty, how come you need more teachers? So, um, but it, it actually is that, I mean, she didn't have a 361. It, be, previous to the 359 that she had in FY19, she never saw her class over 320 at the high school. And so um, these are some really big, um, big numbers for the high school. Um, she's thrilled. We're all thrilled. It's great. It, it provides us, you know, a great opportunity. Um, but we also need to make sure that we're providing the supports that we need at the high school for them. So there, there it is. Oh, about 4,500 in FY19 and now 4,700 in FY21. Um, so these increased enrollments are contributing to our incremental <coughs> increase for Chapter 70 funding. I think everyone, you know, we do need to recognize that. Um, I've, I have tried to look at the formula, to try to figure out the formula, to talk to districts who received money, who didn't receive money. Some districts that I thought were um, identical to us demographically only got 200 thousand dollars as their incremental increase and we got a million um, not sure I, I haven't really peeled it all back why districts that were uh, receiving large sums and and they would break that out that want they would break their incremental increase out so Lynn for example got 30 million but it, they if you're over 1.5 million, they tell you how much of that is an enrollment increase and how much of that is your SOA money. And so in Lynn, it's five, they got 30 million, five million of it was their operating expenses, you know, enrollment increase, and 25 million was SOA money. And I thought, oh, there's the formula, 2080, maybe we're, maybe that. Nope, I looked down the list further. Another district got 8 million and 6 million was their operating and only 2 million was their SOA. So there's something in the formula that is driving the change, and they are not breaking that out for districts that are under 1.5 million. So it's a, you know we really are, are getting as much guidance as we're going to get. Um, we're doing our best to kind of really peel through it. Um, but in in the end, what we're really trying to do is put together a budget that meets the needs of the kids and that we you know have what we need and try to meet some of the priorities that we have. So that's how enrollment has been impacting. Questions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Madam President, <clears throat> perhaps on one of your future agendas or maybe on one of mine in FNF, we should um, delve into these numbers and look at, um, especially knowing that the 40B student enrollment is going to go up even further, look at our school capacities and have a talk about that. I have to imagine some number of people, again, we have so many people watching from home, are um, looking at these numbers and worried about, you know, space in our buildings. And, and it's fantastic that we built this school five to eight so that we have capacity in our elementaries. But I also have to imagine that we're 
you know, if we continue on this projection, we're going to be pushing up against our limits yet again. Um, and then there's the, we had the conversation in our house last night about what does it mean to be um, full at the high school versus um, every teacher has a prep. And so you're not really full because you could put a teacher in a classroom in um, when, when that teacher's out doing prep. So that kind of conversation, I don't think is um, general public knowledge. And I think that we should um, have that, like I said, in between one sure. of the two of us. Yes. <clears throat> Just to give a little further context to Mrs. Disnick's comment. So fortunately, we're talking about the 40-hour project, um, the anchor point development up the hill from the high school, not 40B. And thankfully, my, my fault, sorry. <laughs> because, because poor Peabody's struggling with a, with a 40B. 40B is when you're under 10% of your um, designated, designated or qualified count of housing units in your city as being deemed affordable by the state. Fortunately, we're, we're well above that number. <clears throat> but to the 40R project, where they are now in that they'll be applying for low-income housing tax credit money in December, hoping to get awarded next summer, so a year from summer, probably <clears throat> two school years away from then, so maybe three school years away from now, we would see those units occupied. They're, they may well be funded in two, in two phases. Um, I think we were projecting somewhere in the neighborhood of 120 to 130 school-age uh, kids living in that development at any one time. So it's a few years out, and it may be phased in a couple of uh, sections. But that's, that's something that um, we should keep in conversation with, with the folks at Harbor Light about, um, about how that goes and when they expect to, you know. They'll know better a year from now um, and a year and a half from now as to when they'd expect to have... Uh, units actually occupied and, and kids living there who we you know would want to see coming through the doors in our schools Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I, I did include enrollments of those were all these up to this point these are all students that attend Beverly Public Schools there are also students um, I did not include the preschool at the time um, in those numbers so we also have 125 students um, expected to be in our preschool in FY21 um, up from 114. The preschool numbers ebb and flow based upon eligibility, based upon the number of peers that we have. Um, so, um, but Bethany was pretty comfortable with an estimate of about 125 for preschool for next year. And then out of district, and um, you know, one other factor in our enrollments as we have kids back in our public schools, that means we're bringing them back from out of district, right? So some of the in, of that increase in enrollment may be students that we weren't counting as in our district because they were out of district and now they're back in district. Um, I would just point out that when we bring students, and Bethany has done an amazing job of working with our, within our, within our buildings, with our leadership, creating programming for students so that we can keep our kids in our Beverly schools, um, that comes with um, the need to support them when we bring them back. So, um, you know, a, a lot of the um, quote unquote savings that we might have gotten from bringing someone back in district, we are reinvesting and making sure that we support them so that they can stay. Um, so, uh, you know, I just wanted to be clear on that. I think sometimes we wonder, ooh, where's all the money if they're not going out of district? But we really and truly are making a strong commitment to making sure if we're bringing them back, we're going to support them with what they need and make sure they're successful. So um, I just wanted to, but we are looking at reducing by 11. Yes. So with the tight space that we already have at the high school and the influx of the rise in classes of the grades that we mm -hmm. have now, um, is there a concern for the space for the future classes coming into the high school as well as our new tech program where we're going to try and get some of those kids instead of going to the Vogue stay at the high school? and do the program? It's a good question. Um, so uh, just to clarify, we're not going to keep kids from going to the tech. The same amount of kids that normally go to the tech couldn't still go to the tech, but we really only fill about 20, 22 to 25 seats at the tech in each rising freshman class. So we're not going to stop kids from going, but we are going to offer an opportunity for some of the kids that weren't able to go to do some off, um, some pathway work. So we're calling it pathway work, but to be able to go over and do that. It's a, uh, Lorinda alluded a little bit already to the idea, or somebody did, to the idea that there are um, 
right the the way that we're running the high school right now is that there's sort of uh, it's my room and my if I'm in a prep my room is empty right now so there I, I think we have some space and we have some opportunity to grow that does and I wouldn't want to call it a concern well I say it was a concern we're, we're in conversation about it um, but we're also looking at trying to look at pathways that would f if we have students that are for example we have a health care pathway and so some of the students are now going to go out and hopefully do some uh, field work or something like that within a pathway that would free up some space um, I'm a I'll tell you what I'm a little worried about it maybe when this 398 366 numbers when we get when these guys are getting up to the high school I think we're and that's what we're planning for as we go forward right now um, we're pretty steady though once we get when we start to really think about it we're pretty much at 360 370 if we think of that as our new average we used to I believe for those of you that were here 330 340 that was the number we used to think about and now really that's a 360 so we just have to think differently about that and how we program um, but we are constantly thinking about our space um, and and the space at the middle school is is you know something that we're, we're reworking and looking at and how we're going to make sure that um, we have it our buildings are beautiful and our facilities are flexible and that's one of the things we built into them when we built them so um, I think we're pretty comfortable with that um, we're going to just keep working on it as we go forward if I could give a, a little added context on this point too um, when we built the high school we built it for 1300 students um, when we built the middle school, we built it for 1,400 students. I think in each case, we would have built it for more had the state allowed, but it was a fight to get to those uh, numbers. They, they, um, given that they participate in paying for it, uh, they're very rigorous in how they evaluate your enrollment needs. Uh, that said, the schools are built to what they project out or calculate as 80% capacity, meaning uh, and, and you heard some of the thoughts, Ms. Coelho, about um, if, every, if every classroom is dedicated to a teacher so that when that teacher's got prepped, that classroom's vacant, that doesn't mean that that classroom can't be used and you can't accommodate more kids as an example, right? So um, when you calculate the high school as being 80% built to 1,300 kids, it means it could really accommodate 1,560 kids. Um, the middle school built for 1,400 could accommodate 1,680. That's not to say that is, if, if we approach those numbers, we wouldn't be looking to do different, but mm -hmm. there, is a, there, is, um, there is a capacity greater than the number that they're you know, supposedly built for and the numbers we're at today. So there's, there's opportunity so, to grow those. So I do understand that, but currently for FY21, mm -hmm. we're looking at 1,339 students in the high school. Mm -hmm. And in the middle school, we're currently looking at 1,482, mm -hmm. and that's not including the influx of kids that we could potentially be bringing in from the new development as well. Right. Right. And in each so instance, we've we got it. Well, in each instance, we've got over 200 student cushion in each of those numbers. When you go from these kids at the middle school going right up to the high school, that's almost at max. The high school. Okay. 1482 up to 1560 right it's really gonna it's not that much of a leeway right yeah. but um, you know then then the, I, I think what Ms. Coelho is saying is it, if you took the four from the the four grades right now and put them in the high school we'd be up at 1482 mm -hmm. right and then our max is 1560 so we're already mm -hmm. under a hundred we're down to like mm -hmm. 80 and then we're going to have the influx from the 40R, not 40B. Ah, so very right. sorry about that, Mr. Mayor. Make you have a little bit of extra gray hair there. So it's just, again, it's a, it's a conversation I think we need to have. And I think we need to, um, even saying that the, the maximum really is 1560, I don't think the average person understands how that would be because <laughs> they've heard the number 1300. You built the school for 1300. You built the school, <laughs> right? All of us built the school for 1300 when in fact, you know, there were all these other factors involved there. So it's a conversation I think we need to have on another evening. Yeah. And I also, I mean, I, I also, um, look forward to that conversation because I look at the elementaries and the, who I think you said at building the middle school and having fifth grade come here was 
fabulous for us. Um, our middle schools are, uh, you know, I don't have anybody right now that doesn't have any spaces. Um, however, you know, it's a good conversation and a good thing to look at. One of the challenges with our elementaries is we may have a really big first grade at Cove School and a really big third grade at Hannah and a really big fourth grade at Ayers, right? So there, it's not as if one building, it, 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 it's, it's just sort of uh, odd sometimes, but we, we sometimes have a particular grade level that's overpopulated in one grade at one building, and it's a different grade level at another building. So, um, But we're, I think uh, right now we're doing really well, but it's something I, I think it's a great <coughs> idea to have a conversation and, and look and project out what are we looking at and where are we going. So it's a good thing. Okay. Um, the, again, this is really a repeat. Again, the, just to re a reminder that the Student Opportunity Act commitments that we have, we really do have to meet those commitments in order to do that. Um, we're excited about the opportunity to do that. I think um, it gives us the chance to do uh, to revisit some things. So these are the requests, and again, this is not a laundry list of things that I'm saying we need. Um, these are requests that came forward, and some of them are part of a two to three year vision <coughs> of how we might wanna work things. Um, I will say that the elementary teachers, the 2.3 in grade one in music is something we are, you, that's that 410 going to 425 in first grade. We need to increase our enrollments for the first grade, um, and we are, uh, I, I have to caution you that we are continuing to watch uh, grade one because um, at one particular school um, we have where we are at a pretty high capacity and that's with already an additional teacher. So we're just going to watch it and like we have, like we always do sometimes, we watch a grade level and, and see how the enrollments go. Um, it's still early, so some students are, move out of Beverly, some students move in. We're watching that as we go along. Um, paraprofessionals, that's an estimate from Bethany that uh, those are positions that she is uh, thinking that we are going to need. Part of that is that uh, reclaiming of kids that have been out of district, um, largely in our special um, programs um, for students. Um, one of them is an ELL para for the high school, too. That's neither here nor there. At the middle school, we're looking at five. Uh, are, there's a request for five positions, um, particularly around um, three of those would be in the global apps, and then two of them in academic support. At the high school, there was a request for four positions, uh, a wellness teacher, a social studies teacher, a STEM, meaning uh, science and math, and academic support. Um, uh, there's a, a request for a director of student support. That's a position that we believe addresses sort of the, um, a couple of the priorities on the Student Opportunity Act, the idea of uh, addressing the holistic needs of students, but more importantly, um, looking at it as a role within the high school for helping create those career pathways, thinking about guidance, thinking about um, opportunities, uh, equity, looking at equity for students and making sure we can help get students into some of those advanced courses coursework or um, thinking, you know, just to, trying to reach out that opportunity gap area that Lorinda uh, talked about earlier. Um, a request for a director of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, looking for some content leadership. Um, our, our leadership is very heavy in the humanities. We have, uh, but we're really looking for some uh, administrative uh, content knowledge to come in and work with evaluations and help us with our curriculum planning for science and uh, math in particular. Um, and then these, the, the other three, I mean, in a perfect world, we have an idea of going to our curriculum director, our model with curriculum directors. This is definitely something that's over a, a two to three year plan. This isn't something that we're looking to implement immediately, but thinking about how we would, um, I talked a little earlier about uh, evaluating for efficiencies and then looking for opportunities for restructure. How might we restructure our curriculum supports and um, what would we do with that? And so um, that's part of that conversation. And then uh, a request for some bus monitors to uh, help out on the buses. Um, these are non-staff requests. Um, we believe that, you know, we need to take a look at some of our curriculum materials. We haven't updated them in, in a while. We have licensures <coughs> that need to be renewed. Um, the Essex Tech After Dark program, I'm still hoping that that money will come in a grant, but we won't know about that until the end of March, so we need to have a placeholder in there to make sure that um, we're able to uh, fulfill our agreement that we made with them. Uh, transportation and buildings and grounds are looking for pickup trucks. Their, um, their equipment is old and rusty, and um, they're worried about uh, keeping them running. Um, 
the transportation is requesting three mini buses. Again, that's a conversation around whether or not they pass registration, um, not necessarily for safety reasons, but more for rusting reasons is what I've heard. Um, but again, that, that those are just requests. Homeless transportation is up $41,573. That's not the total homeless transportation. That's how much it's up this year in our budget. Uh, maintenance and fuel, 20000 Technology, sustainability, $100,000. Um, and, and supplies and equipment for buildings and grounds, 71000 So those are the requests that come in. That's what we consider as we build our budget. Um, that's not a, a, a exhaustive list of everything that we're coming forward and saying we have to get. I just wanted to share with you what the re department requests start out like in the budget process. Um, so we have, this is last year's appropriated budget. F Jean has read these numbers already tonight, 51760375 Our Chapter 70 funding came in at 9257567 And our final budget appropriation for FY20 was $61,017,942. And that brings us to our FY21. We're still, um, we're, to be determined is what the city contribution will be on this. But we do know that the, in the governor's budget anyway includes including the SOA money um, for Chapter 70 will be $10,262,735. Um, just a reminder on the legislative process, so FY20 Chapter 70 money came in at 9257000 The governor's budget this year has us targeted for $10,262,735. That's an incremental increase of $1,505,168. Still to come are our, our information on the House of Ways and Means budget. Uh, so the governor's budget goes to House Ways and Means. House Ways and Means comes up with the budget. Senate comes up with the budget. And it's not actually until then that we know what our final Chapter 70 number will be. So some questions? Yeah, um, I think if you could um, speak a little bit to the timing. I, the final Chapter 70 mm -hmm. number often doesn't come until after our budgeting process has mm -hmm. completed. I'll defer to you on that one. <laughs> you know, uh, I wouldn't, I would hope it will be no less than what you see, right? I mean, if, if anything, in, in, in year less. one of the new, the new law, I would hope that the, the governor and, and the two chambers in the legislature would be uh, aligned here. Um, the only thing that I'm, I'm not sure what the talk is up there, you've, you've said, Dr. Trochik, there are districts that don't do as well as they did last year. Correct. I, I wonder if there might be some efforts to try to bolster them, and, and then we would just want to be sure that that doesn't come at the expense of any of the additional new money. And so those um, districts that the mayor's referring to, there are districts in Massachusetts who received the minimum in the, in the Student Opportunity Act, a minimum amount of an increase that you could get was $60 per pupil. However, they had, if they have decreasing enrollments, they are actually having budgets that are, they're actually looking to make cuts. So their budgets are decreasing because in their, their funding, they received the $30 incremental increase per pupil, but it didn't add up based upon the decrease in enrollment that they have. So there's a number of districts that are struggling, um, you know, this year to create their budgets um, just based upon that. Um, and so you're right, I'm not sure what you know what that might be an impetus for and what might come forward or whatever however we've been we have been assured that <coughs> assured as, as, as much as we can be that we should be comfortable that we can use that number that that we probably won't get less than that and, and I'd say that the house typically has their uh, budget debate before the end of April so if we don't see the if we don't see education funding being a big battleground in the house and if we see the the number coming out of the House being the same as the governor's proposal, yeah. you know, even though the Senate won't have done theirs by the, by the point at which we vote our budget, um, still hopefully should have some, you know, some strong indication by that point. Thank yeah. you. Sure. Other questions? Ms. Bisnick. Dr. Shirochik, I wonder if um, you might want to share with uh, everyone here um, the, a little bit of the conversation that you and I had last week around the mm, some information that came out that the funding for economically disadvantaged is per not, perhaps not um, being funded at the same level as was originally promised or at the same level as the other subgroups. So the, so actually what I was, that there was, there has been conversation that it hasn't been. Correct. However, um, we have, uh, I've received some more guidance that <coughs> 
<coughs> there was there's questions that maybe they haven't fully funded their promise around economically disadvantaged students. The truth of the matter is that's because it looks as if there's only a 4% increase instead of a 14% increase. But technically what they did was they lowered the threshold so that more economically disadvantaged students are eligible <coughs> for the incremental increase. So in fact, actual funding is there. It just looks different. It doesn't come forward through with the same percentage as others. And that's the extent of my knowledge on that. So I'm sorry. <laughs> But Again, I just basically think it's it has to do with yeah. Talk about it is that good, here, yeah. It's um, basically because some people are already you know raising an alarm about yeah, that. Yeah, and uh, and I believe that it, the change in the threshold for eligibility for that incremental increase is how they are covering the difference between what what they said how the percentage of funding they were going to give for that. So um, it's just more students are eligible, and so that that's how it works. Thank you. And I don't want to put. Um, Ms. Sherbert on the spot or anything. Um, do, do, She's gonna. Yeah, I'm going to anyway, or try. Um, with the eligibility, I know a couple of years ago when we attended oh. MASC conferences, the state changed to the direct cert program using um, in data from state benefits to calculate the economically disadvantaged, sort of shifted the story for a number of districts. Do we have any idea from our own experience um, whether we, have more or fewer as a result of direct cert and and how do we balance that with our the ESC reporting um, I do not know that answer off the top of my head um, we can um, have the uh, food service director um, give us some information on that mm -hmm. but I do not know um, I know we're utilizing that when we're doing a lot of our scholarships we're calling to see who is already on direct cert because um, we have a lot of times have a hard time getting information to determine it, it, people's eligibility but we can um, have her run a number and tell us what it is from one year to another so I'm actually I actually and I, I don't have enough information to to speak to it with Tonight. real info with mm -hmm. real numbers or anything but I actually believe that's part of the recalculation uh, formula at some level of the lowering of the threshold so I feel like I've got some information, but not enough to share um, until I have more. But I will come back. I will get that information for I, I you. I do wonder yeah. how our district and other districts who maybe are experiencing um, less of an increase, incremental increase, might be affected by some of those factors. I've thought a lot about it, and I don't know for sure if if I'm correct. But um, the re they, they actually the re they re wrote the formula right so in in an effort to be um to, to provide a, a a more equitable funding for districts or whatever um i think that the weighting that they did in in demographics did make a difference um and they but they actually changed the formula so i think that beverly um definitely uh, whether it's um the way that uh, they use the per capita income or the way that they use some of those other things it, it was a significant shift and I think Beverly based on its makeup right because it, it has uh, we have properties that may skew some other you know some other property values in, in another way I think the way they changed the formula and they based it on actual students instead of perceived what might have been the number of mm -hmm. so a big I'll give you an example the old formula said well you should have this many special ed kids they didn't care how many you had they said you should have this many or this is a number that you might have and that's how they funded you as opposed to now they're using actual demographics and actual students in actual um in, in actual subgroups to make those determinations so i do think that had a lot to do with it and I guess my fear with data is always the, the people that you miss, the people that aren't counted because maybe they don't have benefits or that's you know, a big conversation. Or there that's is ongoing. another reason they're not yeah. appearing in the per capita income yeah. for our community. Yeah. But okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other other questions? That's all I have to Yeah, so this is our question <laughs> slide. Do we um think that we have um a, a good handle of um, information presented tonight. We we do have a couple of deadlines, essentially. Mm -hmm. We have the April 1st submission, mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Trocek will be coming back with uh, stakeholder inputs for that. We also have our budget. Um, if I just 
jump down to our next agenda item. Um, one of the things I wanted us to consider tonight was to set a date for voting on our budget. Um, Ms. Sherburn had provided to us a timeline with some no later than dates, but recognizing that we want to, as a school committee, have our um, proposed budget to the mayor in a timely fashion that he can then turn it to the city council for their own public hearings and information set, set sessions with department heads. I um, was wondering if we might want to consider setting a date for May 20th at 6.30 p.m. before our FNF meeting that's scheduled. That would give us one week after our public hearing and half of us would have to be here for a seven o'clock start meeting anyway. Um, that would be the most logical, but really we could pick another date if, if there was any conflicts. Do I would make that motion, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. So what date is that? May 20th. May 20th at 6.30 p.m. prior to the <coughs> FNF. <coughs> would, do we have the following week as our committee of the whole <coughs> at 7? Would that? That would potentially be too little late. Too late. You mean the 27th? May 27th. Yeah. Let me second Mrs. Viznick's motion. Okay. I don't know yep. that we got a second. Yep. Okay. Um, so that 27th would actually be after <laughs> Memorial Day weekend as it falls this year. Um, and yeah, I think that that would run us a, a little too late into the, in the month. Okay. Um, I just want to ask you, Madam President, when you had um, surveyed us a, a week or so back and you were looking at several dates between the 13th and the 20th, based on what you did or you didn't hear back, the 20th seems to make most sense, is that? I didn't survey on this, I was surveying for our retreat. Oh, that gosh. was in April, <laughs> yeah. So April 27th right. seems to be the date that we all could do, by the way, but I will get to that. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, I, I think because half the committee will already be here for 7 p.m., that might make the most sense rather than trying to figure out another night. Um, and it, it addresses a couple of concerns. It gives us a week from the public hearing mm -hmm. in case we hear from constituents and have any thing that we need to look at again before we vote. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Do we have any concerns about moving that date? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to make any promises, but maybe that May 27th Committee of the Whole, if we do all of our work, maybe we... Nope. <laughs> don't jinx I don't want to make any no jinxing. No jinxing. We'll keep it on our calendars, but we we will we will not meet for the sake of meeting. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay. So then we won't have it on the thirteenth, correct? Oh no, we definitely on the thirteenth okay. have our public hearing at City Hall at six thirty, and then um, we will have our regular school committee that will open at seven, and depending on the number of speakers that come to our public hearing. And then generally, best practice is we wouldn't vote on the budget right during a public hearing or after. We'd take some time to incorporate any um, constituent concerns or feedback or revelations. Okay, so May 20th at 6.30 p.m. It would be here in this building um, since FNF was scheduled to be here anyway. All those in favor? Okay. And I will... Make sure Mr. Milady knows that as well. I believe that would work for him. Okay. Can I ask a question? Sure. So um, we are scheduled to have a joint council meeting on the 25th, which would be our next committee of the whole. Um, we're going to need to vote on the Student Opportunity Act plan before April 1st. And so I'm not, uh, it will not be ready for March 11th. Uh, there, okay. You know, we won't, that, that's, I don't believe we'll have it ready for that date for I, I um, think at joint councils historically the city council adjourns and leaves and the school committee has um, had an additional if, if you if that's okay if we could just plan on that that would work I just need to have a, a <clears throat> formal vote before that April I have to submit it by April 1st so, so I need a time and I there's I don't believe if we're having parent forums on the 10th <clears throat> I don't think we'll have it ready on the 11th um, so I just wanted to throw that out there Sure, so for everyone's planning purposes, for the Joint Council, we will try to keep it to an hour and 29 minutes, um, <laughs> allowing us some additional time to give the formal vote. Yeah, great. What, okay. that one extra minute? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Don't want to run over. I will make sure you have a copy of it in advance so that you'll right. be able to read it over. And, and, you know, if you want at that time, sure, feel free to send me questions or, or anything like that as you go. I'll get it to you probably a good, probably the end of the week before that, so. Okay. 
I think that's the end of our agenda this evening. If there's no further questions on SOA or budget, budget timeline. Um, Motion to adjourn. Sure. Second. All those in favor? Sixer, we are adjourned to 842. Thank you, Bev Cam, as always, for recording us this evening. <laughs>